And I welcome everyone back to the second set of three papers. Um, our, our next section of papers before lunch, a very important part of the day. Um, but before that, um, we have three wonderful presentations. Uh, one of them is mine, so I can say that. No. Um, uh, um, the first is um, from Joan Geismar. Joan Geismar is owner and principal of Joan Geismar PhD LLC, a New York metropolitan area archaeological consultancy business that she began after receiving her doctorate uh, in anthropology from Columbia in 1981, although I probably she probably doesn't want me to say what the date is. Um, <laughs> among her projects is 175 Water Street, where she documented the late 18th century landfill techniques, including a 100-foot early 18th century merchant vessel incorporated into the landfill. Currently, she is a project archaeologist for the reno renovation of Trinity Church, as well as New York City Parks projects and FEMA-sponsored projects concerned with resiliency. She is a founding member, longtime board member, and current president of Professional Archaeologists of New York City, a position she has held for numerous non-consecutive terms. So that means that she's been elected multiple times. <laughs> um, she, is, she is a member of the Preservation Committee of the Muni Municipal Arts Society, the recipient of several preservation awards, and in 1999 was designated a New York City Centennial, centennial Historian. Her research interests include community studies and the development of the urban condition, such as landfill, transportation, housing, and sanitation issues. So I welcome Joan to the podium. Good afternoon, and uh, thank you very much, Meredith. Oh, it's still a good morning. Sorry, I'm rushing things. OK. Now we'll see how I do with all this. Together, historical and archaeological data can effectively reconstruct context the context of human lives. Here, the data are used to compare the framework for lives lived in two long gone New York metropolitan 19th century pre African American communities. Skunk Hollow, situated atop the New Jersey Palisades, is what, in what became Palisades Interstate Park, was rural. Weeksville, located in what is now the Crown Heights section of Brooklyn, was increasingly urban. Both were home to marginal people inhabiting different worlds at about the same time. Of course, the, one, the blue dot is uh, Skunk Hollow and the red dot is a week so. Skunk Hollow was founded in 1806, and I say founded in quotes, when Jack Ernest, a locally born former slave, purchased a denuded five-acre woodlot for $87.50. He apparently acquired the name Jack Ernest during this transaction for good reasons. He was Harrington Township's largest landholding African American even before he purchased two additional lots. In time, other free, freed slaves or those who anticipated freedom, such as James Oliver, occupied or acquired nearby denuded woodlots. At its inception, Skunk Hollow was a community in hiding. And I can say that because to the left, to your left, is the um, is 1876 map of Harrington Township, where there is no skunk hollow uh, noted, even though it had been in active for, what, 70 years? And um, to your uh, right is recognition of the colored church in skunk hollow in 1891, which is, that was it, nothing else. Skunk hollow as I said, was a community in hiding that persisted for half a century after ratification of the 13th Amendment in 1865. Initially, Skunk Hollow men undoubtedly worked for their former owners and their owner's neighbors. On early censuses, they identified as laborers, as did William Thompson, an itinerant preacher who became a resident of Skunk Hollow prior to 1841. However, the 1860 census lists Thompson as a minister. On the 1870 census indicates some job diversity. One man worked on the railroad, another was a farmer, and a third was a teamster. At first, Thompson lived with Jack Ernest and his wife Susan, who may have been childless. A, a re, uh, as recounted in Nicholas Gessner's diary, Jack, who was born on the Gessner farm, no, wait a minute. OK, that's the diary entry. Who was born on the Gessner farm, worked to buy his freedom. On the evening of November 19th, 
1841, at the age of about 71, he was severely burned when a spark set his clothes on fire as he dozed before his hearth. He died the next day, but not before Thompson acquired his house and property. With Thompson and his wife Betsy in residence, and following construction of, the, of a church in about 1856, an AME church, by the way, uh, Skunk Hollow truly was a community. Of course, that's Reverend Thompson to your uh, left and Betsy to the right. I have a wonderful picture of Betsy, but unfortunately I didn't use that one when she was supposed to be 106 years old, but she was only 98. I know that. <laughs> At Skunk Hollow's documented population peak in 1880, there were 75 individuals in 13 households, several of them beyond the community core. The community's gradual demise followed Thompson's death in 1886. Perhaps it gave license to live a better life, mainly in nearby towns. Nicholas Oliver, found on the 1910 census, is the last known community resident, albeit not in the Skunk Hollow Corps. Actually, he lived on Turkey Ridge. That's for you. <laughs> um, unlike Skunk Hollow, Weeksville was initiated by African American, oh, I think I broke it, African American entrepreneurs. Let's go back. Um, in 1832, five years after general manumission in New York State, these men made extensive land purchases in Brooklyn's Ninth Ward. Among them was Henry W. Thompson, I think no relation to William Thompson, um, a leader of Brooklyn's African-American community who purchased 32 lots. The goal was to establish a community by and for African-Americans. According to historian Judith Wellman, it was meant to be, quote, Brooklyn's Promised Land, and that's the title of her published Weeksville history. The name Weeksville is, and I will show you what the book looks like. The name Weeksville is associated with James Weeks, a stevedore from Virginia who was among the first to purchase Thompson's lots. While Skunk Hollow began as a small community of and for local freed slaves, as noted, basically in hiding, the Weeksville lots were advertised in newspapers across the country. This outreach was both altruistic and profit-driven. On the one hand, the new community was intended to become a safe haven for African Americans, while on the other, it was a money-making venture. As Judith Wellman says, quote, it was a place created by African American idealists where African Americans could escape constant pressure from the dominant society. However, she acknowledges it also was meant to be profitable, and it certainly was successful. Wellman notes 472 African Americans living in Weeksville in 1865, actually 50 fewer than in 1855. Skunk Hollow evolved as others joined Jack Ernest or settled in the community after his death. The only known communal building was the church where Thompson per preached for decades. Weeksville, on the other hand, was second in size only to the mid 19th century African American community of Cartagena in Ohio. Prior to the Civil War, Weeksville boast, um, boasted the AME and AME Ambarian Baptist Church, the, um, the New Zion Home for the Aged, Colored School Number no. Two, which I can show you, an orphanage, and the African Civilization Society. During the chaos of the 1863 New York City draft riots, its population swelled and, and persisted. To my knowledge, Skunk Hollow was not similarly affected. That's interesting since the population had dropped since 1855, but we'll skip that one for now. Among the differences between the two communities was their 20th century rediscovery. Skunk Hollow, with its cellar holes and foundations located in proximity to Columbia University's Lamont Laboratory, was assumed to be on university property. I would now say never assume anything. The cellar holes were thought to be the ruins of houses inhabited by Jackson Whites, a mix of Hessians who fought for the British during the Revolutionary War, runaway slaves, displaced African Americans, and other society outcasts. Based on what proved to be misinformation on all accounts, it became the location of Columbia University's archaeology field school. And this is a, during one of the sessions at the field school, and I think this is 1976, and it's the church foundation that's being excavated, but only it had only just started. Weesville was a lost African American community that in 1968 uh, was the focus of a Pratt Institute workshop that James Hurley organized. Hurley, a former Navy pilot 
and vice counsel to Pakistan, and later head of the, Lo the Long Island, now the Brooklyn Historical Society, became interested in Brooklyn's Bedford-Stuyvesant's Bedford neighborhood uh, uh, while conducting city tours. As described by Judith Wellman in 1969, when a house was scheduled for demolition within Weeksville's boundaries, Hurley obtained permission to have local Boy Scouts and community members conduct an, an organized dig at the site. However, this was not where the four Hunterfly Road houses, the focus of this paper, were located. The previous year, on a low-altitude flight with Je Joseph Haynes, Hurley saw the four small houses aligned with the former Hunterfly Road rather than the modern street grid. This picture is not from 1969, it's from 1983, actually, but the houses hadn't changed that much yet. This sparked the drive for their preservation. So enter Joan Maynard. A commercial artist by training, she dedicated her life to saving, studying, and promoting the Hunterfly Road houses and all they represent. Through her efforts, the four houses became New York City landmarks based on their design and structural elements that suggested 1830s construction. However, they were not located on one of Weeksville's original lots. Instead, they were on a lot that Frederick Balkening had purchased from executors of the state of Samuel Booten in 1863. Balkening, a German immigrant, was a grocer when he lived in Manhattan and then moved to Brooklyn, but identified himself as a carpenter builder when he purchased the undeveloped lots. A tax record that spans 1868 to 1873, and that was one tax record, it couldn't separate the information, unfortunately, documents five dwellings in three structures, structures on Balkening's property. Apparently double house units, which two of these were, um, apparently were used, were taxed individually. Research, which included Brooklyn directories, indicated the houses were post-Civil War components of Weeksville, when for a time it became a multinational neighborhood that coexisted with vestiges of the African-American of the African -American Weeksville community, and these four houses were one of those vestiges. The age of the houses has generated much discussion and analysis. Considering their attributes, which compare with 1830 structures, Judith Wellman makes a case for Vulcaning moving old buildings to his site, and this certainly is possible. However, based on map data and a building permit in 1883, 1700, um, Ber uh, 1700 Bergen Street was constructed on the site. And I just want to tell you about this map. Um, to your left is the uh, upper, the upper part of the of the slide is the 1869 drips map, which is usually considered very accurate. And where the arrow is is where skunk, oh, skunk all on one place, sorry, where. Um, where the houses would, the cluster, the house cluster would be, and it's not there. And people uh, over the years have thought it was a mistake. And it could be a mistake, but it isn't. It really isn't. It could be time lag. These people, this people doesn't think it's a mistake. They, it, could be a, it could be a time lag, or the houses actually might not have been um, there yet. Wellman also notes that James Legrand, a Weeksville resident and a carpenter, either from Georgia or more likely from South Carolina, lived close by when Frederick Volkening acquire, acquired his Hunterfly Road lots. It's possible Legrand erected the buildings for Volkening in a familiar vernacular style. That said, whether moved to or erected on their current sites, the Hunterfly Road houses were tenanted buildings not available for occupancy until after the Civil War, and possibly not until 1869 or 1870. The Vulcaning family retained ownership until 1968, when Joan Maynard got involved. And now for a brief look at the archaeological record. But first, some background. Skunk Hollow was my dissertation site all those years ago, Meredith. <laughs> after recovery entailed Oh, I'm sorry, artifact recovery entailed a systematic surface collection in and around every, I'm sorry, in and around 20 features located in five domestic clusters plus three standalone features. All were located within a dry, within a dry laid stone wall system that for research purposes defined the community core. Dense summertime growth made it necessary to rake the collection area. And this is the systematic system. This is, um, you know, an ideal. The OC one, two, three. The OC one, two, three. That's the, that is the feature, and the two 
alleyways around it are the extended area that was also um, collected. Collected, and to the to your right is a picture of Phyllis Martin, who was doing a collection within the within the uh, the parameters. And she had poison ivy that day, where she could barely hold the race. Skunk, skunk hollow, don't go in the summer. It was absolutely, it's absolutely, it's a, a poison ivy heaven. But she was there, amazing. The collection method was based on the findings of field school excavations that determined cultural levels and it approximately four inches, that is 10 centimeters below the surface. In other words, there wasn't any deep, there weren't any deep um, deposits. The, the, analyze, the analyzed database, which included material recovered during field school excavation from relevant and, and ex excavation depths, comprised almost 12,000 artifacts. Now, I'm supposed to be looking at something else. Okay. To your left is actually what some of the collection sites looked like. They weren't as nice and squared off. And in the middle of each of those, which was supposed to be highlighted, but it disappeared while I was fixing the slideshow, uh, are the actual features with two extensions outside. The round one is a well, and the, all of these are on what was Jack Ernest's um, a lot or property that was then became William Thompson's. And to your right is a site plan of the Skunk Hollow with this, um, with the, um, uh, I guess the clusters of, house, of houses and features noted and the arrow points to the William Thompson and Jack Ernest's lot and the circle is the church. The Hunterfly Roadhouses, too, initially were investigated as field schools. Robert Schuyler was the first director, followed by his City College graduate students, Roselle Henn and William Askins. Between 1978 and 1982, students excavated two privies, a possible cesspool, and numerous trash pits. Roselle Henn, I think I can show you that. Um, this is a site plan of the work that was done at Hunterfly Road by the by Roselle and William uh, and Bill Askins, and those circles are uh, each of them comprise two excavation units, and the circles show with basically where there were uh, where there were privies. Now where was I? Um, <coughs> And Roselle excavated a trench in front of the houses on Hunterfly Road in anticipation of a utility installation. However, the recovered artifacts were only partially processed and by 2000 was stored in 78 boxes located in the basement of 1706 Bergen Street, a Hunterfly Road house that after it was destroyed by fire was reconstructed by eight, um, in 18, seven, nine, I'm sorry, 1980. That was the first time I saw the boxes, and this is what I was supposed to take care of. <laughs> in 2000, here it comes. In 2000, Wank Adams Slave and Associates, WASA, developed a master plan for the site that included a museum and um, a museum and education facility. A beautiful one, I might uh, tell you, and I'll tell you about that later. As a member of the WASA team, I was to address the long stored artifacts as well as those recovered during excavations related to the master plan. Unfortunately, the field school field notes were not available, although contact with Roselle Hen proved helpful. The processing and analysis of the Hunterfly Road material yielded 8,314 analyzed artifacts and 3,690 for, uh, faunal specimens. I say analyzed because, for example, we would open a bag, and in the bag, in the box, there would be someone's trowel. We didn't, we didn't uh, count that in the analysis. Artifact analysis and histor historical, they were told to keep everything, I guess, during the field school. <laughs> Artifact an analysis and historical research offered interesting findings at both sites. An absence of shaft features at Skunk Hollow suggested that barrels may have collected rainwater and bucket privies, perhaps like this, excuse me, like this one, um, may have received human waste and provided fertilizer for kitchen gardens. Or it's possible there weren't any formal sanitary features at all, perhaps a reflection of community economics or cultural preference, or maybe they just weren't discovered, who knows. Among the findings at Skunk Hollow was physical and artifactual evidence of status within the economically marginal community. It was suggested the Ernest slash Thompson cluster by the size of the cellar hole, the number of outbuildings, and a shallow stone well. 
all were shown before, and I can't show you again. The cluster's food remains also suggested status. While clamshells were ubiquitous throughout the site, all, all of the clusters, the Ernest slash Thompson assemblage included oyster shells, a pricier item since oysters from the nearby Hudson generally were reserved for markets such as New York City. Skunk Hollow's, Skunk Hollow's artifacts did not suggest any matching tableware. Given the fragmentary nature of the material, each fragment represented a vessel. At the time, I interpret this as, a po as possible evidence of hand-me-down tableware or payment for work. However, as we will hear regarding uh, findings in Seneca Village when Meredith gives their paper, it may be that unmatched tableware reflects cultural choice, a possibility to consider. At Skunk Hollow, however, it merely may reflect incomplete evidence. Another who knows, right? In 1980, when excavating in the basement of 1698 Bergen Street, William Askins recovered glass fragments from under the building's north foundation wall. These mended into an, an almost whole bottle. A manufactured date range of 1857 to 1870 provided an 1850 terminus post quem, the date after which it could have been deposited on the site. This clearly indicates that 1698 Bergen Street was constructed on site long after the 1830s. A large, highly disturbed mortared stone cistern with evidence of brick was encountered in the narrow space between 1698 and 1700 Bergen Street in 2002. And I would show you a picture, but it wasn't very photogenic, so I didn't bother. It just looks like a nothing. Anyway, apparently associated with 1700 Bergen Street, it undoubtedly was constructed before 1898 when a rear extension was added to 1698. And it, Part of that extension rests on this feature. Evidence of what appears to be a similar cistern was found on your left. It was found at 1706, 1708 Bergen Street, where the artifacts were stored. Um, demolished during the building's 1980 reconstruction, the feature, which served the double house of six of which that was a double house, is represented by a circle of stones embedded in the concrete floor of the building's extended basement. And I've been told by someone who was with the, with the society for a long time that it was, uh, there was no question that it was something, a, a feature with, made of mortared stones and unfortunately they did demolish it. The dimensions and details of the, of the cisterns uh, are the one at, six, at um, 1700, Bergen Street and this one are similar to one excavated at a nearby mid 19th century German enclave, the village of New Brooklyn. Might Vulcaning initially have given his tenants a cultural feature? Or might whoever constructed these, all these features, whatever their ethnicity, also have constructed the one at, uh, at uh, New Brooklyn? Well, I said that wrong, but that, you know what I mean. But again, this is speculation. Municipal records, although incomplete, suggest Vulcaning was slow to provide available sewer connections to his African-American tenants. Two cesspool features, one of them associated with an outdoor toilet appended to 1700 Bergen Street, at least through the 1920s, support this suggestion. Artifacts and photo material from uh, the Hunterfly Road houses document the abandonment of, of features, land alteration, the availability of goods, and, and um, I'm sorry, uh, land, the availability of goods and daily practices such as farming. Oh, I forgot to show you this, I'm sorry. Um, this is where the cisterns uh, were located. The one at the bottom with the, the green circle at the bottom is the one that's in the basement at 1706, 1708. And the one uh, uh, up higher is where the, 17, uh, the one associated with 1700 is, uh, was located. And you can see how close well, does it look that close? It really is close to, uh, to the building that is uh, 1698, which is on Bergen Street. Um, and here are some of the artifacts. All but the ones in the upper left corner came from uh, feature one, which was the privy behind, six, uh, behind 16, 1706 and 1708 Bergen Street. And these are just nice artifacts, but the one in the right, upper right has a terminus post quem of 1880, and that's one of the earliest terminus, excuse me, terminus post quem 
Z that we have. Up on the left, which I found really interesting, came from the uh, excavation unit. Uh, they, the Scott, the um, field school used two excavation units that discovered each of those of their privies, the two privies. And this was in, in the excavation unit, but not in the privy. And those are farm tools. You know, you have the scythe, you have a screen for sifting, you have a shovel, you have a pitchfork. Or they had a shovel, they had a pitchfork, and they were in the, they had been thrown away. Because there were trash pits all over the yards, and I think it may have been to raise the land up, but it's just that's just speculation. There also are suggestions of cultural identity. Now here are a few more artifacts. The ones in the upper left, uh, the circle is around a little figurine, and it was very small. This, this picture was taken at a place that's now gone called the New York Unearthed. It was wiped out by Hurricane Sandy, but these artifacts were on display. That figurine was very small, and it's obviously an African-American man dressed in a tuxedo uh, and was a, a servant of some sort, but it's sort of a joke, I think. And on the bottom, uh, bottom right is a fragment of a Hoyt's cologne bottle, which um, the woman who works with me remembered was mentioned in, that was Shelley Spritzer who works with me, was mentioned in um, To Kill a Mockingbird when scouts talking about an African-American cemetery and the lovely scents that, that were around. And one of the scents was from Hoyt's Cologne, which has a very long history, but this bottle is probably from the 1920s. Or, I'm sorry, this fragment is probably from the 1920s. In addition, based on archaeological and documentary evidence, apparently at least two of the four houses in the cluster, 1698 and 1700 Bergen Street, were constructed on site. So my finish is, I do not presume to know what life was like emotionally or personally for the residents of Skunk Hollow or for the tenants of the Hunterfly Roadhouses over the hundred years that each functioned. What I can offer, and is briefly noted here, is to touch on its, the historical and archaeological framework for these lives. That said, I can only assume for those living in these African-American communities, as with each of us, everyone's sense of place was unique. Thank you. Thank you, Joan. Um, and our next presenter is Rebecca Yeaman. Uh, Rebecca holds a PhD in anthropology from NYU and spent 20 years as a principal archaeologist with John Milner Associates Incorporated in Philadelphia. Her first major project with the firm was the analysis, interpretation, and preparation of a six-volume report for the Five Points site in New York City, a report I know that I've consulted quite a lot. Um, and I believe there are over a million artifacts if we're comparing these quantitative stats of numbers of artifacts processed um, from that site. Uh, during the restoration of Independence Mall in Philadelphia, she directed large excavations on the site of the Independent, Independence Visitor Center and the Liberty Bell Center. More recent Philadelphia projects include the Convention Center Extension and the Museum of the American Revolution sites. She is author of Digging in the City of Brotherly Love, Stories from Philadelphia Archaeology, and uh, Archaeology at the Site of the Museum of the American Revolution, A Tale of Two Taverns and the Growth of Philadelphia. She also edited a special issue of the journal Historical Archaeology devoted to the Five Points Project, and wrote the book Rediscovering Raritan Landing, An Adventure in New Jersey Archaeology that interprets 20 years of work at an 18th and 19th century port site in New Jersey. So I welcome Rebecca to the podium. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be included in this wonderful symposium. Uh, OK, glasses. OK. I like to start with the stuff. These two chamber pots were found in a backyard barrel privy on the site of the Convention Center expansion in Philadelphia. John Milner Associates did the investigation in 2007. The lot with the chamber pots was one of the least disturbed on the site. It was sandwiched. Here's a good urban picture for you. 